And our final speaker is going to talk about adult palliative care in a value-based payment model. Thank you very much. I just, uh, I hope I don't upset the photographer over here. I'm going to stand. That's all right. I'll walk a little bit, but not too far. Um, I'm Dana Lesbader. I'm a critical care physician by background, uh, hospital-based for 20 years, and segued into palliative care about three or four years ago on the outpatient side. Um, so very familiar with the ICU world and inpatient world and got very interested in looking at ways that we could do it better by supporting people more at home uh, through home-based palliative care. Um, I work at ProHealth in New York, which is a 900 physician multi-specialty group. And within that 900 physician multi-specialty group, we serve over a million patients, but 100,000 of them are in a shared savings arrangement. So we have a Medicare shared savings program, ACO, with about 35,000 members, and then the rest are other shared savings programs too. So we built this home-based palliative care program about three years ago with a particular focus in the Medicare shared savings program space and then expanded it to our other uh, uh, shared savings contracts. This is our typical patient, Frank, uh, again, 87 years old with multiple chronic conditions like heart failure and some kidney disease, uses a walker to get around. Uh, his uh, son is his only child, and his wife is quite elderly and really very distraught with uh, trying to care for him because she's elderly uh, herself. And as we know, with usual care, there are multiple trips to the ER, multiple admissions because he looks that way. And especially in New York, where we're so overbedded, if he just shows up to the ER, he's going to be admitted. And he'll quite likely go to probably my ICU uh, because that's just uh, the way that it would be handled there, especially at an off hour. With home-based palliative care, he gets all of this kind of care at home. We do provide 24-7 telephonic support, and we do have uh, virtual visits, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we also provide caregiver support. We help coordinate other uh, services and help families realize that they need to privately hire, if they can afford it, home health aides. But very often, people don't even realize it's time to get extra help at home, and that, by the way, it's, it's not free. And so if families can't afford it, we do try to help them get extra support at home as well. And with good care at home, where we do answer the phone and people speak to a nurse or a doc whenever they call, never get a voicemail, um, we've been able to accomplish some very good outcomes, which I'll share. So this, the space that we're really looking at is, is this red space here, this care gap where uh, patients are really pre-pre-hospice. They don't qualify for hospice or they choose not to uh, uh, enroll in it. They don't want to give up other treatments. So we're really looking at a population that's about 18 months or so before uh, dying and also people with multiple chronic conditions that uh, get them into the hospital, so super users. Um, and what we actually do is we actually look for these patients. We don't wait for doctors to refer them to us. About three years ago when I came to ProHealth, I thought um, that I would just wait for these 900 doctors. I went around, did lots of dinner meetings, and went to all these different practices in New York City and Long Island. And uh, everybody was very excited about palliative care. The next day I would get a lot of phone calls about their mothers uh, and wanting us to see their mothers, which we did. But what happened was after three or four days, I, we saw all the mothers, and then there was just really this sort of, it dwindled off. And so we said, let's be more strategic about how we find the sickest people. And because we're a Medicare Shared Savings Program ACO, we have access to all the claims data. So we uh, wrote an algorithm uh, pulling in all the claims, and certainly there are limitations in using claims-based algorithms to find people with palliative care needs. There are some real gems in the data. So for example, um, finding markers of frailty like if someone has had a hospital bed ordered for them in the past. That has a positive predictive value of dying in one year of 70%. So we were able to look at all of our 35,000 members and find every single person uh, who has had a hospital bed ordered for them. Um, yesterday I was running the data, somebody was wondering about COPD on home oxygen. So there's, I think, 732 people in our ACO 
who are on uh, home oxygen with COPD, and we can even query it further and say how many of those have had a hospital admission or two and tailor that down. And in fact, when we really looked at that population with two or more admissions, that was 300 in some patients. So we're really able to identify patients with very high need and then target them. Um, we don't wait for docs to call in the consult, so what we'll do is we'll just identify the patients. We have an engagement staff that will call the patient and say, you know, Mrs. Jones, we noticed that you've been in the hospital twice. Um, we we're wondering if we could send a nurse out to check in on you and see how you're doing. We don't ever use words that might be a barrier to patients and their families. We actually don't use the word palliative care. We just say we'd like to come in and check in on you and see how you're doing. We noticed you were in the ER four or five times this past two months, or we noticed you haven't seen your doctor in over six months, um, and would you like a little extra support at home? And most people, when we make that call, really welcome that support. In fact, we have the opposite problem. After six months, we do strategic disenrollment for people that are too healthy for our program because it's expensive to deliver home-based palliative care. So every six months we do strategic disenrollment and a lot of patients and families really don't like that. Um, and so we're trying to you know, target them better so we don't put ourselves in that position, but there are some people that had high utilization and then that, that really declines or they get better um, and they really don't require this level of care. We might follow them telephonically or using a video call every month, but they don't really need home-based palliative care with docs and nurses going out to the house. Um, what we do when we enroll patients is we send the doc a lovely email and it's templated and we just say we've identified your patient. Uh, we think they could benefit from extra support at home and we just go and see them. Uh, we are 900 docs and there is shared savings. So when we have savings with Medicare or our five other health plans, everyone shares in that savings. So there is some financial alignment. There are a handful of docs that are very sensitive to our involvement. We know who they are, and we, I spend a lot of my time reaching out to them, making sure that we don't do anything without making sure they're aware of it. But more often, patients like Frank actually don't have a captain of their ship, and there really isn't a doctor that knows them. Uh, they might have four or five different doctors, one from Sloan, one from Sinai, one from NYU, one from ProHealth, uh, and no one's talking to each other, and the electronic medical records don't connect. So it's more common they don't have anyone who's the captain. The other thing we look at is our hotspotter list. So we meet with our health plans every month, and they give us a hotspotter list, and every health plan has a list of future high spend, or uh, they have a predictive score for death, Whatever their score is, their risk predictive model score, we actually love that kind of data, and so we'll actually target those patients as well. So not only do we target the Medicare Shared Savings Program patients, we also work with excuse me, other health plans to find the patients with the highest need. So we're very, very data-driven in how we find our patients. When patients are admitted to the hospital and discharge, we get notifications of that, and we'll risk stratify those discharges in real time. So we'll do a LACE score, which will look at the hospital length of stay, whether it was an acute or uh, an emergent admission, and we'll look at other comorbidities. We use the Charleston Comorbidity Index, and we're able to track that through our claims data, and then we can tell whether it was an emergency room visit or not. And so we'll be able to score those patients and see those patients within three days of discharge. The clinical triggers that we, we do uh, look for, um, five or more chronic conditions, and in fact, most of our patients have five or more chronic conditions. It's very typical. It's not just one. They don't fit into a bucket, um, but they have many chronic conditions. We take a lot of end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis who are not hospice eligible, have very high needs, a very high incidence of depression, untreated, um, and very uh, symptomatic. And so we really take patients uh, of, of all um, with all diagnoses and multiple comorbidities. We also look at patients with uh, two or more hospital admissions um, and a high risk score. Um, and this is sort of the demographic of, of what it looks like by diagnoses. Again, primary diagnosis here. But one thing you'll notice, again, this is primarily a Medicare population. You'll see that cancer is really only 20% and multiple chronic conditions is the other 80%. This is different than our commercial population. We do serve some commercial members as well. And in the commercial space, younger patients, it's, it's maybe 70% cancer uh, or even 80% cancer. So very, very different. Um, 
the average age of our patient is 87, just like Frank, who I pr uh, described at the beginning. So frailty, functional decline, uh, multiple other chronic conditions. The way our staffing works is we're an RN social work model. So what we've really done is we've really tried to leverage um, and make this a scalable model so that it's an affordable model. And so it's an RN social work model. So we have three uh, RNs. We've got a half a social worker and about a half or three quarters of a doc, a palliative and geriatric doc. And that's a pod. And each pod can take care of about 250 patients or so. So each nurse has about 80 patients. And uh, there are visits that are once a month in the home at a minimum. So everyone is dosed based on need. There are some patients that need to be seen three times a week. Right after they get out of the subacute rehab or the hospital, they might be seen twice that week. Um, other patients are just seen once a month. So all of the visits are based on what the patient and family needs are not by anything uh, that's just scripted and routine. So it's all based on need. Uh, we have interdisciplinary team meetings twice a week, 90 minutes in person twice a week. Um, and we run over our very difficult cases. We look at patients that might be hospice eligible. We do a lot of teaching. Um, we will sometimes even um, ask a family member to do a virtual visit with us and a patient so that we can do, um, uh, have a visit with a patient that might be really difficult and use that for training and also ask the patient family if they mind teaching, just like we had Vicki share her story this morning. It's a wonderful way to leverage real patients in the setting of an IDT where you actually bring them in virtually to your IDT meeting. Um, we'll also do um, one on one So every week, the RN social worker and MD meet for one hour. That's in addition to IDT. Uh, interdisciplinary team meeting, and they meet to go over anything that might be de-prescribed or prescribed. We more often de-prescribe because most patients are on 22 pills a day, and we have found that's too much. So we actually try to really reduce that. So part of the one-to-one -one meeting with the RN and the doc is actually to de-prescribe and reduce the pill burden. Uh, we do a lot of telepalliative care, and the way we do telepalliative care, we use a HIPAA secure platform. Um, and so we have the nurses download the app onto patients' smartphones or their grandson or granddaughter's smartphone or their caregiver or their home health aide's smartphone. Uh, and we just put this HIPAA Secure app on their phone. Uh, and that way they can join us in this room. This is my room. Um, and I can meet with a patient. So this is a patient who uh, has ALS. She fell into a radiator uh, a few weeks ago and it's sort of scabbed over. Um, and there's some fluctuance behind it, and she was worried about it. So we can actually do this sort of visit. Uh, I'm in my office, and she's in her home. We can do a visit like that virtually um, right on, on the patient's own smartphone or family caregiver's smartphone. So it's really like FaceTime, but it's HIPAA secure. We also can use it for advanced care planning. So very often, we have family meetings where the son is in Boston and the daughter's in France and the patient's in Queens. Um, and I might be in my office and the nurse is with the patient. So we can bring everyone together to discuss um, hospice enrollment or discuss a treatment plan that we're working on with the patient that day. So we can do advanced care planning, have a family meeting. We can bring in everybody at a time that's convenient for everybody into this virtual room. We also provide a lot of family caregiver support using a telepalliative care. So if the daughter who's caring for mom is really stressed, um, we can actually provide support. And by seeing what's going on and saying something like, you know, I see the comforter you have on your mom's bed. It's really beautiful. Um, and she just looks so clean and comfortable there. You know, you've done an amazing job. We're able to give really detailed and specific feedback because we're actually seeing that, yes, in fact, the patient's mother is beautifully kept and comfortable in that bed, and that is not easy. So really family caregivers uh, like this quite a bit. One of the barriers to it is it, it is a little hard for elderly people to figure out how to download an app, remember their iTunes password or all that, that sort of stuff. So it is somewhat of a barrier when folks have to do this onto their phone. But once it's on their phone, people really do like it and are able to reach us. And we do provide 24-7 coverage. And so very often on the weekends, we will see patients this way and save them from going to the ER. Um, the, the picture that you see on the left is our team meeting. So uh, this can hold, I think, up to 50 people in the room. We have about 25 people on our team. So every Monday morning, we do a Good Morning Monday call, and we review everybody that's called in over the weekend. So we can deploy everybody Monday 
uh, and rearrange schedules based on needs, who needs visits on Monday morning, based on who called in over the weekend. So this is our team meeting, and whoever is speaking, their face floats to the top. And that's what it would look like, too, if you're doing a family meeting. The one in the middle um, is a patient that we uh, got right off a of Medicare Advantage hotspot or list. Uh, and we have a shared savings with this particular health plan. Uh, and we now actually serve this health plan for a per member per month rate. So they pay us a bundled payment to serve their high risk patients in Queens, Nassau, Suffolk. Uh, we're expanding also into other parts of New York City as well. Um, but we serve them on a flat rate. So we're not on that hamster wheel where the more we do, the more we bill. We just get a flat rate to deliver the care. And interestingly, we've been with this health plan now three years. I was disenrolling patients every six months, as I would ordinarily do if patients don't have high need or have been in the ER. And they, they wouldn't allow us to disenroll anyone because the savings were so high. So we had to keep them. And then the third patient here is just a routine visit. Uh, and we do these routine visits every month. She just throws the phone right down on her wheelchair, and we have a visit that way. Um, what are the outcomes of a program like this? So we published this in January, and what you can see in Medicare Shared Savings Program, ACO, where we have access to all the claims data and true total cost of care. So we have access to the true total cost, which includes hospice, home health, all Part A. It's not carved out like Medicare Advantage. We were able to show that people who got home-based palliative care cost $12,000 less than a control group. And we used a greedy match to find an exact match to the control group on 22 other parameters. It's done by actuaries at Optum. So it's a very rigorous study. We've expanded this study. And we also see at least a $2,000 per enrolled member per month savings for those that do not die. So there's savings in patients that don't die as well as those that do. Um, particularly strong savings, as you would imagine, in the final three months of life. And that's where the, the bulk of that savings is. But it's quite pronounced. Um, uh, you can see here on the blue line uh, is um, the home-based palliative care folks, and the red line uh, is um, usual care, and you can see what happens with the expenditure, primarily because people get very symptomatic at end of life, and they go to the hospital for treatment of their terminal symptoms. And people, of course, would much rather be at home, and so when we prevent those final hospital admissions in the final couple of months of life, people spend more days at home, and it costs less. Uh, where do people die when they're in our program? Well, interestingly, in New York, where we are, only 25% of people who get usual care get to die at home. Enrolled in our program in home-based palliative care, over the past three years, 85% of people who die are um, at home. About two-thirds of the patients who die are with hospice, and the other one-third are with us. And the ones that stay with us are the ones that have chosen or are not eligible for hospice. They might have dementia and the dwindles and don't really qualify. Or they've chosen not to give up dialysis or chemotherapy. And so they still get to die at home, uh, and they don't have to um, go to the hospital for those symptoms. But we do utilize and partner with hospices in New York. Also, people who are enrolled in hospice from our program have a median length of stay of 34 days compared to seven days in New York and Long Island, which is the median currently. So um, it's a much longer length of stay when they are enrolled. Um, how can we really help people? Well, you know, certainly I think fee-for-service is uh, an enemy to good palliative care. It just drives the churn, and it rewards excessive care. Um, and I think new payment models, alternative payment models that reward team-based care, care that includes nurses, social workers, and docs, 24-7 availability, as well as tending to psychosocial needs. So innovative models of, of payment are really critical um, and would allow us to deliver the kind of care people need, which is that 24-7 care, and primarily with a focus of care at home. <laughs>